Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to part two of the study that we just uh, were doing today, and we somehow had technical problems and lost the hangout. Uh, so we're studying the book of Acts, chapter 12, and uh, so we're going to pick up where we left off last time, but uh, uh, I, if, if you did watch, we're watching it, and you, the suffered uh, from these technical problems. Of, I don't know what happened, but we're, we're going to try it again. Uh, all right, so I'm going to read the verses again that I just read, and um, hopefully you guys will be able to hear it this time. Um, um, Okay, verse, start with verse 11, chapter 12, verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where uh, many were gathered together praying, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. All right, brothers, go ahead. Well, I mean, what can you say beyond uh, what this amazing text says? I mean, Peter, finally, when he gets outside the gate, uh, you know, when he's after he gets there to the, to the city iron gate that opened for himself, and then the angel leaves, it's kind of like he's like, Oh, wow. When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know for sure, for, of a surety, that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people. Maybe he's just finally getting the big picture, uh, but it, it is kind of funny. Uh, Peter probably wouldn't have been a morning person, it looks like. Uh, when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, etc., 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 and they were still there, what, guys? They were still there praying, you know. Uh, they were gathered together there praying. I mean, these, these people really believed that prayer could change things. Peter knocked at the door, and here comes Rhoda, and uh, she knew Peter's voice. Peter probably had a, uh, you know, a distinctive voice, like everybody does, and uh, once you know somebody well enough, you know their voice. And uh, she knew it was his voice, and she just <laughs> is so so freaked out about it. She doesn't even open the gate, but just ran in and say, hey, I got good news, Peter's here. Well, uh, I love the King James where it says, and they said unto her, thou art mad. <laughs> you know? uh, we'd say, you know, today's vernacular, we'd say, you're nuts. You're absolutely crazy, Rhoda. Go go to bed or something, you know. Uh, you, you, uh, you got a chemical imbalance or something. <laughs> We'd have some some reason to you know to think she's she's gone off her gourd you know just absolutely nuts but she constantly affirmed that it was so she's like listen I'm not crazy this is true then they said oh well we're gonna appease you and just say it's your angel <laughs> or I mean it's it's his angel like like Peter had a guardian angel well he did earlier in the night didn't he but Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him and were astonished. Yeah, I would, I would think so. And Rhoda had the last laugh there. But this, I, I mean, pe people just, just examine this text. And the Bible's an exciting book, ain't it? I mean, when you look at what transpires in these things, it's not just uh, history and literature. This is, this is some amazing stuff. Uh, I'm looking forward to going on. So back to you. Yeah, it, it, I, I, I just got a laugh. <clears throat> they had two parts. Number one is Rhoda not answering the door, but instead running back in to tell everyone Peter's there. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. That's just hilarious, you know. 
And uh, I remember when I got back from uh, uh, California after working for this Chinese company down in San Jose, I came home and my granddaughter uh, was the one that opened the door and she slammed it on me and went yelling to everyone that I was home. So th that's a real reaction and it, it's kind of funny. Uh, the second thing is, is Peter finally acknowledging to himself, this was not a dream. This wasn't a vision. This really happened. And, you know, that, that just rings a, a truth, too. I mean, I remember there was a, a book by, a, a Sherlock Holmes book, and, and uh, Freud was a, a contemporary of Doyle. So Freud had uh, discovered that if you write a note to yourself and put it in your pocket, if you think you're dreaming, you won't be able to read the note. It will just be all squiggles because you can't read a note in your dream. And so Peter's doing one of those things, pinch, pinch, but okay, you know, all right, I'm still here, I'm, I'm awake, this is real. And so that's the kind of experience I, I would love to have. But uh, Peter had it and, and uh, related it very well here. Back to you, Lee. Hmm. Well, the um, thing I, I find interesting, and in part, part of the reason I'm going to say this is this is not an original idea, but this is a commentary. Uh, I don't know if you can, if the light shows or not. It's a commentary in the Book of Acts by Dr. Peter Ruckman. I, I have about 40 of Dr. Ruckman's books. For many years, I trusted him and just accepted all of his positions KJV onlyism, uh, dispensational futurism, and so many other things. I, I disagree with him on quite a few things now, uh, but um, I still admire him and respect him in, in so much. Uh, but he has an interesting take on this that I've never heard, and it's. Uh, let me read this so that you can see why he would say such such a thing. Um, said, um, uh, and they said to her, "Thou art mad." But she, const but she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. Uh, now, I know that uh, Ted didn't uh, uh, you know, address this portion here. I, I guess he thought that, uh, he, I think that the way Ted explained it was his angel like it was his guardian angel. But the way that I see this, and the way that Dr. Ruckman sees this, is they understood this as a, a Peter's spirit, he, that Peter was dead. They never expected to see Peter again, um, because uh, James was just killed. Um, Peter was waiting to be executed, and they figured, oh, it couldn't possibly be him. Uh, he he's dead and therefore it's his spirit that's appearing to us but uh, the other thing is they also they they can't imagine the, that Peter could be freed because if, if he was actually freed then that would mean that he had done it again he had recanted uh, I don't know him no I've never met him no, I've never heard of the man. Three times he denied him. And so there's the theory that, well, if, he's, if he got out, he must have recanted. Peter did it again. So this is how Dr. Ruckman explains, explains all this. And so if we read it with that thought in mind, you know, let, let me read just a little bit further. Um, but Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished because, as I said, they never expected to see him alive again. He was to be killed. It's either got to be his angel, uh, or maybe he's get released. No reason for him to be released unless he was uh, uh, recanted. Uh, verse 17, but he, beckoning unto them with a hand, uh, to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. All right, well, let me stop there.
uh, see if you have any thoughts on all that. Yeah, this is uh, this is this is great here. The way this continues, uh, you know, Peter just kept knocking. They opened the door, saw him. They they were truly amazed. I think they thought uh, that their prayers would work, uh, maybe through the legal process, or maybe that their prayers would would keep him alive and keep him from harm in prison, uh, keep him from uh, physical uh, punishment and so forth. But I don't think they planned to see him knocking at the door that very evening, released without any uh, legal uh, proceedings going on. Um, you know, he just, he's obviously outside when it says he's beckoning with the hand. He's like, you know, without saying, get over here, come here. Or maybe it's, uh, maybe it, when he says beckoning with the hand to hold their peace, he's just going, hold it down, you know, don't freak out too loudly. And he said, uh, he, it's pretty interesting how he says, he declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Now that right there, do, do we think um, that was, you know, the angel of the Lord, meaning the Lord Christ, who, who brought him out of out of prison, or that the Lord used an angel uh, to to take him out of prison? I, I don't I don't think we're specifically told that that it was the means uh, uh, that it was actually the angel of the Lord, meaning like Christ, or if it was just God used an angel to deliver Peter. Now we can we can speculate on that. Talk about that if you guys want to. He said, "Go show these things unto James and to the brethren." And he departed and went uh, went into another place. So um, I mean, this things are happening quickly. Things are hopping, and uh, this obviously is still nighttime. So uh, this could wake them up real quick. Not not that they weren't awake, but I mean, uh, a heightened sense of uh, awareness that the Lord was truly working in this. Back to you, brother. Yeah, I, I disagree with Ruckman uh, simply because if if they were thinking that it was Peter's spirit, number one, uh, I don't think the saints had that that worldview of uh, a spirit come a knocking, and uh, number two, uh, they wouldn't have said, "You're nuts, Rhoda, mellow out, take a nap." Uh, so uh, I don't think that they thought that. I think they just thought she was hearing things. Uh, so. But, and also, I don't think it was a Christophany, and here's why. Uh, Peter was pretty darn good friends with the Lord, and uh, there would have been personal interaction. The Lord would not smote him to wake him up and told him what to do. Be, he'd be going, Lord, Jesus, you know, my friend. You know, there would be personal interaction. And so uh, none of that was commented on. So I think he was just commenting that the Lord had sent an angel. And that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good point about your second point your, your, your first point um, I'll remind you though that um, to take it as his spirit uh, doesn't surprise me because when, <clears throat> when Jesus was walking in the water in the storm they didn't think it was him they thought they thought it was a spirit so there's an example of them you know thinking that it was something was a spirit but uh, the, um, the you make a good point about the uh, the Lord not interacting with him and Peter saying, "Oh Lord Jesus," uh, you know, it seemed like that would happen. But um, when you look in the Amplified, here's how they say it, uh, starting with verse 15. They s said to her, "You are out of your mind." But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, "It is his angel." But meanwhile, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were completely amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be quiet and listen, he described how the, the Lord had led him out of the prison. So two things there in the Amplified, they take it again, saying it is his angel, and then that the Lord had led him out of prison. So that's how they... They see, interpret it. All right, shall I go on or any more on that? Uh, I'll, I'll give my answer to that, uh, and that is just because you say it louder and more amplified doesn't mean it's right. I'm sorry, little joke. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Let's see, back to that. Uh, someone's got to be back. back. 
Okay. okay. You still, still. Uh, I can't. I can't. Let me see. Let me see. Some, some. Oh, you got it. Got it. I can't continue unless you mute. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I was getting uh, nothing but echo back. Okay. Uh, verse 18. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. I think we can look at those two verses. Yeah, this kind of takes me back to the, uh, you know, what would what would uh, what happened to the guards? I, I know it sounds like the guards were paid off uh, regarding uh, the guards who were guarding Jesus' tomb, but these uh, the guards that were there. Uh, Herod just commanded them all to be put to death. Uh, I mean, uh, no stole, no small stir among the soldiers. Yeah, I think that's putting it lightly uh, about what had become of Peter. How, how does somebody just disappear? You know, uh, a notorious, you know, quote, criminal, you know, a, no, a, a person of notoriety being held. Let's put it that way. Um, so... Uh, Herod looked for him. Say, where is he? Is he just, you know, down in the, uh, you know, is he just down in the kitchen, uh, the prison kitchen, or something? You know, when they found him not, uh, he examined the soldiers, examined the keepers, the guards, and says, okay, uh, what do you guys know? Uh, this is it. Okay, death penalty, immediate, carried out, which is which is uh, understandable in that day, and uh, which is, I believe, how the death should, death penalty should be carried out once it's once it's uh, commanded and, and ruled on uh, immediate execution. But uh, uh, that's another thing altogether. Back to you guys. Yeah, what a serious slaughter. Uh, Ted had looked up uh, the, the meaning of the word quattro or whatever it was, and it was 16. So I don't know if they were in shifts or what, but uh, a lot of people met their death that day. And it also shows the importance of Peter. Uh, Peter uh, was going to be brought before the people uh, prior to his judgment. And these guards are nobodies. And so uh, Peter uh, evidently is a, a very renowned person, and, and he, he needs to have the people's backing to, to kill him so he doesn't start a riot or uh, have, have repercussions. But these poor guys, uh, they met their end. The, uh, the sentence of death, I think, is important because uh, we, we, it's helpful to understand that, that that's how seriously Rome and also even Herod and his, uh, uh, their, their attitude towards a guard's responsibility. Um, and, and we could apply this to uh, two other cases. Uh, we haven't come to Acts chapter 16 yet, but there's a point where... Um, Paul and Silas could leave the, the, the jail and, and the, instead they stay there because the, the guard is going to kill himself. He thinks that the prisoners have, have escaped and he knows the sentence is death so he's going to just kill himself. And so that tells us that's, that's the standard operating procedure. It's a death sentence if a guard fails in guarding their prisoners. And the other thing, of course, is the guarding of the, the tomb of Jesus. You know, there's no body. What 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 happens to the guards? Well, they have to be killed. Uh, but in this case, in that case, if you watch that movie Risen, I, if you haven't seen it, everybody has to see the movie. It's it's really a great best movie I've ever seen about the resurrection and the body and what happened afterwards. Uh, and we we can see that. Uh, uh, if the body, body, the guards failed in guarding that body, they should be killed. So, what happened to the guards who were guarding the tomb of Jesus? Well, I've watched the movie The Resident. Um, all right, any, any more, or should we move on? Uh, just to make a note that it's ten minutes before. Oh, okay, yeah. So we'll, we'll uh, if we're quitting now, then let's go ahead and give your 
sum up your thoughts. Let me see where I am, though, so I can make a note of it here. Um, uh, what, what first did I just read? It was during its own... Yeah. Okay, so we'll pick up next time with verse 20. 12, 12, 20 next time. All right, guys, why don't you uh, sum it up, and then I'll give a gospel message. Well, I think it's a great account here of, uh, of what, what God has done in the past. doesn't mean he'll operate this way again today unless he wants to, and I know we know he could, but uh, the thing that sticks out to me is uh, God can do miraculous things. God can, uh, can change uh, events. Uh, in in history that involve uh, uh, people of, uh, of people in positions of political leadership, he can he can do miraculous things. But um, we also know from the book of Hebrews that uh, other people uh, there in chapter eleven of Hebrews talks about the great people of faith uh, didn't get released, uh, were tortured, sawn in two, uh, made desolate. Uh, made to wander out in caves, uh, sheepskins, goatskins, etc. But uh, we just have to trust God in all these circumstances. Praise God that Peter was free uh, to continue ministry. And uh, the thing I'm taking away also from this, brothers, is that uh, the saints there who were associates of Peter, his uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, believed in the power of prayer, and they were interceding for him. And regardless of the results that we end up seeing in any circumstance, uh, the thing to do is just to continue to pray, seek God and seek his wisdom, and, and trust him with the results. Um, that's what I'm getting out of this, brothers. Back to you. Yeah, I, what, I, what I'm getting out of this is uh, it gives us a glimpse into uh, how God deals with things that we normally wouldn't see. Uh, it gives us a glimpse into how he uses angelic beings on our behalf uh, that normally uh, would not be recounted to us. Uh, Ted made a very, very good point that stuck with me throughout the study uh, of putting yourself in someone else's mark moccasins here. Uh, the point of view and the real accounting is incredible detail. I mean, the details that God uh, inspired the writer to put into these accounts are just gold. I mean, not only do they convey the reality of what's happened, but they make it real to us. And we see through the eyes of, of uh, Luke here uh, exactly what's happening and in such a way that we can feel it. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that's solid gold. So uh, those are my thoughts. All right, so uh, after Stephen was killed, it said that everything changed and there was the church was really persecuted. And uh, I'm sure that there were many members of the church that were uh, jailed. And it, it doesn't say killed, but it, it says Paul was slaughtering, slaughtering them. So I, I have to assume that they were being killed during that time. And so now we have the account of the f first of the original 12 apostles uh, being executed. Of course, we know that Judas killed himself, but of the uh, 11, uh, they went all, all went continued on in their, in their faith and their, their uh, ministries. And th this is the first that we see, the brother of John, James, who dies for his faith at the hand of Herod with a with a sword, uh, and eventually they all will suffer death for their faith except the Apostle John. So uh, um, now this, one of the things about this uh, account of Peter in getting out of jail, um, uh, as I was uh, ex you know, reading it and trying to explain it and asking questions, Someone might think, well, are you, are you really even a, a believer? It sounds like you're questioning a lot of things. And
Hey, Joe, you still there? Joe, you still there? I don't know. I, I lost both of you, and then I lost you. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to end my my summary and just give a gospel message real quick, and, and hopefully it'll keep working. Um, the most important thing we say in every one of these broadcasts is we want you to go to heaven after you die. We want you to have eternal life in heaven. And what do you have to do for that to happen? The Bible says there's one thing that is required. In fact, it says there's only one possible way to, for you to go to heaven, and it's by putting your faith in the Savior, Jesus. The reason he's called the Savior is because he saved you from uh, condemnation and uh, second death. So you can be saved from that and instead have eternal life in heaven by putting your faith in Jesus. Jesus is eternal God Almighty, and he became a man. He became a man so that he could die, and he did. He died on a cross and paid for all our sins. And on the third day, he was raised from the from the dead, and he walked bodily for 40 days among witnesses. And that bodily resurrection is the proof Jesus provided for us so that we can be confident that he is our God and Savior and that faith in, our faith in him is justified. So please put your faith in Jesus now, and if you do, from that moment forward, you are guaranteed you're going to go to heaven, not because of anything you've done, not because of any good things you've done in your life, because but because of the good thing Jesus did for you. He paid for your sins, and he gave you eternal life as a gift when you put your faith in him. I hope you put your faith in him now. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.